Hello and welcome to another Out of Spec podcast episode. Max joins me. Max, the Volvo EX90 was just released and this thing looks pretty freaking incredible. Now you've had a chance to take a look at the Volvo EX90 and have gone through some of the specs. We're going to talk about pricing, availability, how to reserve one, all of the nerdy details that we could find out about this thing. And what's cool is you and I have both have a ton of Volvo experience. And I think no secret, we're Volvo fanboys. We love Volvo stuff. So what's what's going on here, sir? This thing looks pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, this is basically the next iteration of Volvo's XC90, but they're not just ready to kill the XC90 yet. They're going to sell this alongside XC90 as the electric uh, twin of it. And if you've been paying attention to Volvo and their sister brand Polestar, this shares a lot with Polestar 3, which is a really good thing. But it has the traditional boxy shape that uh, you and I love so much with, you know, the big old XC90. Now, it, for me personally, I really like that Polestar 3, but this to me visually looks a lot better. The one thing that always kind of, um, uh, I guess is a bit of a pain in my butt is like, I want all the performance stuff from the Polestar side. I want the big brakes, that cool suspension, the limited slip rear diff that you and Jordan talked about on the previous podcast when you talked about that car. Um, whereas I don't think a lot of the spicy stuff will be coming to the Volvo side. This is going to be more luxury, more cruising. Is that true? Yeah, not the spicy mechanical stuff like the LSD and suspension setup, but you are going to get a similar performance powertrain option that you can uh, get. Now, they're not revealing any details about specific pricing, but Volvo's official statement is well optioned for 80000 So I guess we're looking at it seems like about ten grand cheaper than Polestar 3, which is obviously that more performance oriented uh, take on this. And I think that's smart to price it higher, but I just want to start at where this is going to fit in the Volvo lineup, because obviously it looks so much more futuristic than XC90. It looks like the next iteration. Why are they selling XC90 combustion when <laughs> this is on the market? That makes no sense to me. Who would walk into a Volvo dealer and say, oh yeah, I want the old one? When well, it's hard for me to say not working for Volvo, but my guess is if it's kind of like you just drove the i7, right, which BMW is selling alongside the gas seven series, right? So for these really important vehicle segments, I don't think any car maker, even one as aggressive about electrification as Volvo, is quite ready to say, oh, you can only get the electric one. Uh, what I like here, though, is unlike seven series and i7 with BMW, uh, they're actually letting this be a new platform. So mechanically, this is a whole different world from XC90. It is uh, SPA 2. So their next scalable product architecture. Uh, so this is really the one you'd want to get if you don't mind the fact that it's electric and will have a little bit less range than the gas version. But XC90, which I think they're going to bring their T8 plug-in hybrid system to, is still going to be a great car for people who do want you know, combustion for whatever reason. But the XC90 isn't going to get the updated styling as this car. It's going to stay as it is, which is still a great looking vehicle. That is a vehicle that has aged since 2015, is it, when it launched? 2015 All the way, model year. Yeah. Yep. Until now. And it just still looks incredibly modern and wonderful. And we've done reviews of XC90 on this channel, the, the T8 plug-in version, not the extended range. But we've done XC90 T8s here. And um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful vehicle. So let's just gloss over the fact that they're going to sell the old one and the new one alongside of each other. Uh, to me, it's a little bit like when Range Rover Classic went to the P38 body style in 98, was it? 96, maybe? And they sold the Range Rover Classic alongside the new P38 modern one. Uh, and a lot of people still bought the Classics, as I would have. So I think we'll see, uh, hopefully that strategy works out well for them. Um, but I'm really looking forward to them going fully electric by the end of the decade. And that is a global fully electric, not just for markets that have the infrastructure. They're claiming we're all in. We're not going to be making combustion cars after 2030. Is that right? Yeah. So eventually XC90 will go away completely. For the moment, they just don't want to kill it yet. It's such a successful product line for them. You know, leave it there for the people who want it. But EX90 is the future of that class of car. 
Very interesting. So let's talk about this thing in particular. You mentioned it's built on the SPA 2 platform, which is Scalable Product Architecture 2, same as Polestar 3, <laughs> which is uh, the Polestar numbers really get me all confused. But um, what's what's this thing powered by? What's the battery pack? What's the motors? What's all the, the nerd details? Yeah, so nerdy details, their net or usable battery capacity is 107 kilowatt hours. It looks like there's just going to be one battery option uh, globally, at least so far from what we know. And they're saying that they hope a 300 mile range with this battery pack. Now, 300 mile range, I think coming from the base powertrain. So there's two motor configurations. You can get twin motor standard, which is 402 horsepower, 568 pound feet of torque, zero to 60 in 5.7 seconds. And then if you want to get spicier EX90, but don't want to quite go for a Polestar 3, you can get the twin motor performance, uh, zero to 60 in 4.7 seconds from that. That's coming from 496 horsepower and 671 pound-feet of torque. So I'm not sure if they're the same motor and they're tuned differently. It's not a world of difference, but you do get that one second delta in zero to 60 on the spicier one. Right. No, makes sense. That's pretty interesting. Um, okay. Well, that sounds good. So it's 107 usable and 111 gross, I just saw. So very mm -hmm. small buffer. So my guess is Volvo is going to recommend a 80 or 90% daily charging limit, just like they do with uh, XC40 and C40. They're like, hey, don't full charge this thing unless you go on a trip, which is how I think most electric cars are starting to work now. And in my impression, that makes a lot of sense. Um Max, just I'm looking at these photos here. What the heck is going on with the roof of this thing? Yeah, that is Volvo is very proud of it. They actually had this teaser video all just about this system. They've integrated LiDAR and all of the sensors for uh, their adaptive driving system into the roof of the car. And they're super proud of this as a design element. They want to be loud and proud about it, but they also want it to kind of sit aerodynamically, not to look like one of those like Waymo test drive, you know, vehicles you might see in the Bay Area driving around. They want this to be like a finished product. And so I don't know what your thoughts on it are, but it's a pretty interesting design decision to take um, sensors and hardware from self-driving stuff and make it a design feature of your car. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it looks really interesting in a bad way. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, people are going to be like, is that car wearing a top hat? You know, what's funny is it reminds me of, uh, well, first of all, the Polestar Precept had the thing, uh, their concept on it, which, okay, similar teams collaborating. But then also it reminds me of a production vehicle, which is the Xiaopeng G3. Uh, and then that one had the little selfie camera that looked like that, but it popped out and would track your phone and then take a picture of you. So I wonder what other features they can unlock with something like this. But the LiDAR situation, um, you know, we know that they're going with what is the company that they're choosing for LiDAR to work with? Do you remember? Because I know who it is. I just can't remember the name. Oh, gosh, I forget. It's the same one that Polestar is using. I know what you're talking yes. about. I know when it comes yes. to the compute and the software side of things, they're going with NVIDIA. So NVIDIA being the big graphics card right. company. Luminar. Uh, Luminar. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, so Luminar they're, they're... hardware, NVIDIA software and chipset. Yeah. And so, you know, obviously Volvo and Polestar relatively, this is a small car group compared to some of the giants out there, but they are backed by Geely partial, I think 50% ownership or maybe a full ownership from Geely of Volvo uh, group. And so whatever we see here in Polestar in EX90, these things are going to spread across to more models, specifically China models, um, because that's where Geely is based, of course. So Seems really cool. I'm looking forward to trying the driver assistance system. I recently just drove the BMW i7 um, and maybe even iX had it too, but I know for sure i7 has LiDAR in a production vehicle in use here in the US. And so to me, I'm glad to see the extra tech. I think it's fun to play around with. I worry about that sensor on the roof. Like that's got to be such a drag in terms of aerodynamic performance. They I wish they found another way to integrate it. Like the i7 is right behind the front grille, really nice. Um, but I think Volvo is promising even a little bit more driver assistance capability than what others are working on at the moment. 
Yeah, not just in the sense of capability, but right, Volvo is such a safety focused brand. So they have cameras outside and in. They have the LiDAR stack and that, you know, weird hood. But on the inside of the car, there's going to be two cameras just for driver monitoring. And there's also going to be radar for monitoring the back seat. So the idea being, let's say you're inebriated, you're not paying attention. The car is kind of going to nana you and say, you're not driving, buddy. Or let's say you leave your kids or your dogs in the back of the car, the car will actually automatically initiate this like pet mode where it'll, you know, keep the AC system running, but also alert you as the driver to be like, hey, you just left your kids or your dog in the car, um, you know, go do something about that. So it's going to be a very kind of proactive system. And I'm, they haven't said this, but I'm guessing because of all the sensing that you're going to be able to do the autonomous driving without needing your hands to be on the steering wheel. Yep, sure. And I think they are going to go for a, like what is not technical term, but level two plus, which doesn't really exist, but that's the hands-free eye tracking, or maybe even a level three in certain situations where you can really just hands off, eyes off, uh, you know, do what you need to do. And then the car will ask you to take over. I Can we talk about how just incredible this interior looks? First of all, first thing I notice is that seating material, having that wool material on there. I've been saying for a while now that leather is no longer premium. These textiles, these next generation materials, this is how you separate your brand. Um, and so I just love the seating surfaces, really love the headrest design. You can see a mix of leather in there, perforations. And then of course you get this center vertical touchscreen. Interesting they're going vertical when everyone seems to be moving to horizontal, especially Tesla. They've got a very Mustang Mach-E screen here. And then of course the Bowers and Wilkins tweeter right there on the dash, just so you can look over in traffic and know, yep, you spec the good sound system. Yeah, they're really going ham with the interior. And I think it's amazing. I really love all those interior directions since, you know, the new XC90. My mom has driven the 2015 one, which is that launch year when they originally redesigned it uh, back then. And this just seems like a great evolution of that. I agree with you. I think their materials approach is brilliant because they're advertising, right, the wool blend and the recycled textiles. So it's not only this message of like future luxury, but also sustainability. Volvo's making a big deal about how much recycled uh, floor mats and plastics and uh, even the aluminum and steel structure of this car, how many elements of those are going to be recycled and post-consumer reused. So, you know, I think that fits in with their messaging really well and kind of defines this new modern sense of luxury. I think particularly in hot environments, people are getting kind of sick of leather because it can be so sticky and just, you know, I, I personally don't love it that much. So it's great to see that we're finally departing from that. Uh, whether or not you're vegan and eco-conscious, I think it's just a, a great next move. Totally agree. So let's, let's sort of sum this up. Um, actually, before we do that, let's just touch on the big highlight stats really quick. So we're working with 400 horsepower, probably 300 kilowatt power output, um, which would be 402. Um, 496 horsepower, if you get the twin motor with the software bump, we assume, we don't know if it will have bigger motors or not. 107 kilowatt hour usable pack. Mm -hmm. 300 mile EPA range is... They haven't hopeful. said which cycle. That's the manufacturer. Oh. Goal. They, they're hoping 300 miles. We don't know what standard they're using for that. Well, with 107 kilowatt hour usable pack, honestly, they should, no excuse not to hit 300 miles from an efficiency standpoint. Because what does IX have? That's like 108, somewhere around there. Maybe like mm -hmm. 105 usable. I don't remember exactly what it is. I just love this shot with that rear taillight right there. Um, they but have that great thing. Product photography. Yeah. And so the IX did like 340 miles in the worst range configuration with roughly similar size battery pack. Now, granted, this is a three row SUV, so it's going to be against Mercedes EQS. This is where the smart money goes. The show money goes to the EQS SUV, even though I love both. And um, I just think like, wow, this thing looks incredible. But um yeah, I, I would, I'm surprised they're so conservative on the range with a battery pack that big and with technology that big. But that comes down to two permanent magnet motors, which isn't always the best idea for highway distance driving. And the reason is you can't really shut off a permanent magnet motor without flux-related losses. So do you think they're going to put a disconnect on the rear axle and run front-wheel drive? Because I think it's set up to be a primary axle front-wheel drive and secondary rear 
typical Volvo format, sadly. I believe, like you said, that's what they're doing. Just like with Polestar 3, their approach is using the front as the primary axle. Their justification for that is, look, Volvo is not a performance brand. It's a, it's about the efficiency of regenerative braking. And if you're only running one axle, well, of course, more of your mass is going to break on the front axle when you brake. So uh, that's their philosophy there. Makes sense. And yeah, it does seem like they're being really conservative about range. But to be fair, um, they're being quite honest. The drag coefficient on this is 0.29. That's not leading edge, right? The Mercedes stuff blows it out of the water. Uh, the IX, I'm not quite sure where that sits, but this is similar in frontal area to that too. Uh, but like you said, this is a three row SUV. It's a large vehicle. I do like how Volvo has though, they haven't done this kind of slim sport back approach to say, oh, let's squeeze the most range. Let's try to get some aggressive styling. They've kept up virtually the same dimensions for cargo capacity and passenger space as XC90, which I think is a really smart move because most people probably would trade off, you know, a little bit of range for having the super practical boxy cabin. Yeah. You know, I'm just going through these photos here. And to me, I think this is one of the best designed interiors of any car in the business right now. Um, so attractive. Love that little Bowers and Wilkins tag in the headrest there. Uh, and technically, it looks like Volvo is catching up a little bit too because of uh, their charge rate is really impressive to me. Now, this is a 400 volt class of vehicle. It is not an 800 plus, you know, really high voltage stuff, but they're claiming a 250 kilowatt max charging rate which would put it over the 500 amp maximum that CCS allows. And so how the heck are they going to get 250 kilowatts? I don't know, unless they're expecting CCS to open up and deliver more. We have seen some cases of 400 volt cars getting 250 kilowatts on public DC chargers, um, mostly Tesla's using the uh, CCS adapter. So that would be pretty incredible. Really looking forward to that charging curve. Um, if we look at Volvos of past, they actually, when they launched, charged like garbage. They had no battery preconditioning. You could just tell Volvo had no idea what they were doing. Then they issued an over-the-air software update and completely changed the charging profile of the car, had the battery pack warming on the way to a charger, and it's like, oh, they woke up, they got it. I've actually done videos with their lead battery engineer. They're on our Out of Spec Reviews channel talking about these topics and others. Um, and he was like, yeah, well, look, we got it. We know exactly what we need to do. And he just kept saying, Kyle, wait for the next generation. Wait for the next gen. It's going to be crazy. And so I think we're kind of getting into that right now. And part of that is showing next gen stuff is V2L. So do you know the details of the vehicle to load stuff that we can expect on this, Max? Yeah, one more note on charging and wanted to mention of obviously we don't know the curve yet, but they did say 10 to 80 in 30 minutes. So even though you're seeing the peak 250 kilowatt rate, they're still being pretty conservative with 10 to 80. 30 minutes isn't bad. It's better than, you know, some of the stuff on the market now, but it's by no means bleeding edge. There will be plug and charge too. They've confirmed that. Okay. Uh, but on the note of vehicle to load, so their press release doesn't call it vehicle to load. They say they're just going to offer the ability to have bi-directional charging. Uh, but... Okay. As nerds, we know that mean vehicle to load is a spec, right? That Hyundai and Kia use that uh, you had on Chadmo years ago, but now it's coming back into um, CCS world. So Volvo is bringing that through some, I believe, proprietary adapters and equipment that they will be happy to sell you. So not many details, but you will be able to power appliances. And I think potentially your home with that big, you know, 111 kilowatt hour pack on this SUV. Interesting. So I think it's going to be a bit more like F-150 Lightning then, where they'll actually give you a CCS connector for your house and then have an inverter mounted inside. I don't know if you'll be able to like plug in a toaster like you can with Hyundai and Kia. Or they did mention or... accessories, uh, okay. like appliances. So I'm guessing they're going to offer some kind of funny dongle. I don't know if yeah. it'll be exactly like the Hyundai Kia one, but yes, they also will sell you that big inverter box for your house. We don't know how much that's going to cost or when it will be available, but you will be able to, I think, use this car as a backup generator of sorts for your home. Nice. And I'm just looking here. I can see a front trunk looks pretty big as well. So that's one cubic that's foot of space. Good. Wow. Okay. Well, better than whatever they got in their existing stuff. Um, so yeah, what's the price on this thing? We mentioned it at the beginning, but about 80 grand for a well equipped equipped one. So it's probably going to start at 75. Is that correct 
no idea. All they said is under 80 grand should be able to get you a well-optioned one. So I'm guessing that's for twin motor standard, not performance, maybe without that, you know, Bowers and Wilkins Dolby Atmos sound system. I don't know what kind of options we're looking at, but I'm guessing you'll be able to option this, you know, north of 80 grand into 90 grand territory, uh, which would put it kind of in competition with like R1S and the BMW iX and that class of vehicle. Totally. I mean, this this market is heating up, and I just have to give props to whoever shot these photos as well. These press photos are stunning, um, just really, really well done. Um, and look, it's got this little guide on the inside. Take a look at this, and it says, "Will it fit?" And it just shows like everything you can kind of put inside. <laughs> That's a really lovely cool. bit of Volvo classic personality. Uh, and on the note of personality, uh, I don't know if we can show the animation for this, but the headlights. Volvo yes, fans will know Thor's hammer has been a super distinctive feature since the you know new XC90. It's on their whole lineup now. Well, this is the next generation of that. These headlights look pretty wild. Right. So let's actually look at this diagram. Really complicated headlight unit. We're talking multiple crystals, it almost looks like over here. Whole bunch of individual squares all blown apart. You can see it can do projections out with their matrix headlights. No question, of course. Um, there's the LiDAR exploded, but I just want to show everyone this animation. And actually, there's a little bit better one if I go over here to the videos tab to show you ultimate Thor hammer headlight animation. Take a look at this. Whoa. What's going on there? Is that like a door that opens up? What What is that? It looks like a mechanical aperture. So I guess the matrix, you know, things go away on servo motors to reveal your full projector headlights for nighttime. Anyone who sees that is going to be like, what is that? I want that car. I think that's awesome. Crazy. Also, don't accidentally bump into anything because that's going to be like 10 grand. <laughs> yeah, headlights might be like a third of the cost of this car. Who knows? That's crazy. So my guess is that will be an additional upcharge over standard, maybe market specific. Um, in the US, we sometimes and usually get very high option cars as standard. But in Europe, I wouldn't be surprised if that's an option. But what a cool machine. I also love how they included the little Volvo badge inside the headlight. Always a nice little touch right there. Really love that. But just the way the light animation works and then opens for the headlights, pretty wild. There was also a clip in this uh, video right here. I'm just going to mute it really quick. And I want to show you this in motion. So this is it. Whoops. This is it moving in motion. Did you guys, did you happen to catch that there, Max? Check this yeah, out. Yeah, so the animation kind of playing out. Yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, you'll see the headlights move right there. That was a real life shot, not a graphic. That's so cool, isn't it? Yeah, Just it's insane. really, I mean, lighting has become such a personality feature of cars, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, they've all done an excellent job of it. And Volvo is really flexing hard here, I think, kind of showing their A-game. Um, really cool to see. And Volvos have always been a step down in ultimate features and tech and, you know, this, that, and the other. You know, like the i7 has this big screen that comes down from the roof. Like, this isn't that kind of stuff. I would say Volvos have always been priced a little bit more premium than average, but give you this feeling of just, mm, I don't know, really good and feeling of living Nordic room luxury. Is what they say they're aiming for. Say that one more time. They're hoping for a Scandinavian living room vibes. You have this like backlit, like wood accents in the interior. They're trying to make it very like earthy, minimal. If you're familiar with the Volvo brand, none of this will be that strange, but yeah, not quite as high tech as some of their luxury stable mates, but you are going to get on the tech end of things, Android Automotive on that you know, big vertical screen. So they're going with like a simple, but kind of a high tech approach, but not overly flashy. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I can't say enough good things about this initially. Certainly uh, seems like the, uh, like a great mom car, you know, just to haul around the kids, great family vehicle should be very safe. And of course this will set the stage for future products to come down the line.
we always know this from Volvo when XC90 launched in 2015, it set the direction for the entire brand to go on the spa architecture with updated Thor's hammer headlights. And they all kind of feel the same, just in different sizes. That's what I love about Volvo is even in the smaller cars, you can option the inscription or the R design versions and get the same quality that you can get in the big ones in a smaller package. You're not giving up anything. So huge props to Volvo for jumping in finally, I would say, to the hardcore EV space. Of course, it helps to have that backing Geely partnership. But my impression is they really let Volvo run with this. And uh, I think it looks better than Polestar 3, although that's a great looking vehicle. Uh, this is certainly the desirable box on wheels that we love from Volvo. Thank you for not making a sporty, uh, sport back, stupid, coupified SUV thing. And um, thank you guys for watching this podcast. Let us know what you think about the EX90 in the comments below. Uh, I really don't want to show this to Alyssa Max because I think she would say cancel the R1S and get this instead. Which would you choose? Well, off-road adventures, I think the R1S would win every day. But in terms of the luxury on-road dynamics, the sound system, from what we know about how Volvo has done Bowers and Wilkins, um, this would be my pick for an on-the-road car. I don't know how Alyssa would feel, but man, I think this interior is going to blow anything in its price range out of the water and really compete with more expensive stuff like Mercedes EQS right, SUV, which is uh, like $130,000. Right, but much um, more feature rich in EQS. More, more flashy and feature rich. But if you're into that more kind of minimal Scandinavian aesthetic, uh, there's, you know, you don't have another option. This is pretty sweet. I think a lot of Tesla owners are going to be driving their Model X, seeing these things on the road going, ooh, should probably. I, I think Franz might be tearing up a little bit yeah. Yeah. Yes. when he sees this. Yes. Okay. Well, uh, if you want to reserve one, just head to the Volvo Car USA website. You can $500 reserve it. I believe it's fully refundable. We might be doing that today if, if I show this to Alyssa. Can't thank you guys enough for watching this Out of Spec podcast. Plenty more to come. Every day we have a podcast for you uh, and sometimes two a day. See you on another one soon. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.